if you're really looking for the origin of socialist ideas today, you might begin looking at the face of the person that you see when you look into the mirror. Because most of us are actually practicing socialists a good deal of the time, even though quite a few of us don't, or say we don't, like socialism. We nonetheless tend to practice it. The, the uh, expression of socialist ideas and the carrying forth of these doctrines really often begins in the home, and it begins in the relationship of parents to their own children. Now, I'm, I'm very unhappy to have to tell you that, but that is the case. It begins sort of, I suppose, like this. Uh, you take a young couple, they're married, and in the course of a year or so, here is their firstborn. And it is a very thrilling experience and a, a wonderful thing. Here is a new little flame of life, and it's entrusted to them. They begin, of course, taking care of it, because if they don't, it will die. Uh, the, the child is born helpless and has to be looked after, so they look after it, and to begin with, naturally, they are, they're just concentrating on his physical well-being. But after a matter of uh, a year or so, they are aware that this creature has a brain. It is learning to think. And therefore, they better do something about that, too. You can't wait until it goes to the government school because, of course, in the government schools now, you don't have, you don't learn reading. You learn remedial reading because you've missed it. Uh, so you, you probably like to begin to teach your child to read before he gets to school so that he'll at least uh, be able to understand what they're talking about. So most parents will end up going down to a bookstore that features children's books, and they'll buy uh, some books uh, to bring home, and then they'll begin reading them to the little boy or the little girl. It's usually one or the other. And uh, uh, the, uh, the books that they will begin uh, often will start here. Uh, for instance, there's a dandy little item that uh, I cut my uh, first reading teeth on, and possibly you did, or possibly you have assisted your children in starting here. This is a, a, a cute little story about Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Well, what's that about? Well, that's about a little blonde who goes into the woods and gets lost. I might point out that this becomes a more recurrent theme in adult literature, but we started here. The, uh, this little blonde goes out into the woods, and she gets lost, wanders around, and is naturally frightened. Finally, she comes to a house. She knocks on the door, but no one is home. So what does she do? Well, she commits an act of breaking and entry. Uh, she goes in and performs petty vandalism on other people's property, ends up consuming property that isn't hers, and finally gets into a bed that isn't hers, and... Uh, uh, falls asleep. Well, presently, the owners come home. Now, incidentally, you're going to find this true not only in juvenile literature, but in most adult literature. The owners of anything are cast in the role of villains, always. In this case, <laughs> the uh, owners are three bears, and they come in and they start grousing. They say, gee, our house got broken into. There must be a thief around. And they look at their property, and yes, it's been damaged and consumed, and they say, gee, look what the thief did here and here, and then they walk into the bedroom, and there she is. They catch her right there. She awakes, screams, and makes good her escape. And, of course, the moral of the story is that if you're cute and blonde and in difficulties, you can break into anybody's house, and you can end up the heroine. It doesn't make any difference, because this is all right. Well, now, that's the kind of thing that we have and we begin convincing our own children that this is perfectly standard, normal behavior. Well, after you've uh, started them off on that, uh, there's another little story we have called uh, Hansel und Gretel. It's an import, but it carries out the same theme. This time you have two blondes, a boy and a girl. They both go into the woods, and they both get lost. And they wander around. They finally find a house. In this case, they don't even knock. They just rip pieces off and start eating the pieces whereupon the owner of the house comes out and says, Hey, kids, what are you doing to my house? Well, that's a fair question. And they say, Well, we're hungry, so we're eating your house. Well, the owner says, That's not the way to behave. If you were hungry, why didn't you knock and tell me so? Come inside and I'll fix a meal for you. Well, now, that's a pretty high-type thing. But now the author tells us, they tip us off, the, the children in the story don't know about it, but you and I know it as the reader. The owner in this case isn't a bear, it's a witch. 
And this witch is not really fixing a meal to feed to the children. She's just getting the oven warm. She's going to eat the kids herself. And what happens? You see, the children don't know she's a witch, but nonetheless they watch their chance. And when this lady, who apparently is fixing breakfast for them, bends over the oven, they grab her from the rear, shove her in, slam the door, and fire up. Shades of Buchenwald. How much conditioning do you want to give to your children? And this goes on. Uh, Cinderella and the glass slipper has these same overtones in which the only lick of work done in the story is griped about and moaned about the work happens to be cleaning out a fireplace. You'd think it was a work in a, as a galley slave. And Cinderella moans and groans about this until magic occurs. Her fairy godmother arrives, commiserates with her, says, you poor darling, to think that you have to do a chore. Isn't that pitiful? Well, don't worry. Fairy Godmother is here now and will help you. And, of course, then, by magic, Cinderella gets to go to the ball, dances with the prince, and escapes at the stroke of twelve. You know the story. And in the end, she marries the prince. And, of course, the moral of the story is, if you are given a chore to do, <laughs> well, start to gripe. And if you gripe enough, something magic will happen, and everything is going to be all right in the end. In other words, what we start doing with the child we create in the mind of the child the idea that somehow the world owes him a living, that there is a social good, and everybody's really looking after his interests, and somebody somewhere likes him, loves him, in fact. Why? There is no discernible reason. Can the child do anything? That isn't mentioned. Does the child have any ability or talent, any dedication to accomplishment? Not necessarily. The child is just there, and consequently, we all, society, owe him something. And this is the kind of thing we do in our literature, beginning with the children, and, of course, the same thing appears right on down the line. There, here and there, only occasionally, do you find a work of literature, either junior or adult, where the owners of property are viewed as heroes or even as decent people. There is a certain arrogance that I have detected in so much of the socialist writing, a kind of arrogance that presumes to say that anybody with money is just automatically unhappy. They just don't like to be rich, so for their own good, we're going to take their money away from them. And this is the kind of thing that you run into. In examining what I've seen, I don't think that... Uh, uh, this fellow Anassis is particularly unhappy. Uh, he seems to get along, and I happen to have had the pleasure of knowing a number of people who are millionaires, and I think they're just about as happy as a lot of other people who aren't millionaires. I don't think it, money makes you either happy or unhappy. It just provides a means that you can use, and you can use it wisely or foolishly as you please. In any case, uh, you have this, this tendency to create socialist ideas and socialist dependency right in the home, and it manifests from the very beginning. So there's no wonder that we have a great deal of socialist thinking in the country today. But now here is an interesting thing. It brings us right up to the present time. Today, the French Revolution and all of the extrapolations coming from it, including the, uh, the Russian, the Chinese, and that portion of the American scene that is in a state of unrest have begun to realize a certain thing, and that is that their position is scientifically unsound. This is why today what we call the left in this country is moving more and more into the realm of metaphysics and mystery. They are becoming increasingly involved with uh, things that are anti-intellectual, and deliberately so. They want to set aside the age of reason. They want to introduce an age of emotion. They think that the way you feel is more important than the way that you think. Now, that is characteristic today because, in point of fact, the socialists have already lost the intellectual argument. That's true. And in a sense, it's almost a shame because in many ways some of the things that the socialists say are valuable. 
There is an element of love here, an element of compassion, an element of understanding that I think individualists have been very prone to neglect. And while I would have to contend that the intellectual position of the individualist is correct and scientifically sound and provable, nonetheless, there is a side to life that has to develop the other side of the person. We are not, as human beings, simply cold, detached, objective mentalities. We are vibrant, vital human beings. And this is something that perhaps we owe the socialists. When they laid stress in this area, they did us an important service, and we should keep it in mind. In actual point of fact, there is a way wherein we can combine the concept of good feeling and the recognition of the merit of the individual as an emotional unit within the intellectual context and the scientific footing of the individualistic theory. That can be done. It will take effort, but it seems to me that if we move in that direction, the very first lesson that we have to understand is that we are going to have to move the government out of the position of making decisions for us. Whether the government is making decisions that, are, that tend to support individualism or tend to support socialism, the fact that it makes the decision deprives us as individuals of both our opportunity to think and to feel. And it is important for the development of man that we emerge as full-fledged adult human beings capable of thinking and feeling. And this can be done. Thank you.